Well, good morning from uh, New Delhi to everybody who's joined in, and a good evening to all of you who are in the evening time zone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this session, uh, which is the closing uh, uh, session on predicting the post. at North Macedonia and former Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, uh, Mr. Ranil Vikram Singh. So I'm going to start with uh, you, Prime Minister, uh, and, and ask you about uh, what are the key uh, trends you see in a post-COVID world. Uh, we are looking at uh, issues of uh, collaboration. We are looking at issues of leadership. Perhaps you can give your perspective as, as a public figure, as a head of state. Um, what, what, are, what is needed for us to come together again? Well, I think it's a response to the social and economic disruptions caused by uh, COVID that will decide uh, future in the next coming 10, 15 years. Other is building trust in leadership, whether it be global leadership, whether it be political leadership, or whether it be business leadership, because leadership is one issue which failed in the COVID-19. Uh, the West just couldn't measure up to it. Actually, China, India and others did a much, much better job in helping others. <coughs> the Western leadership uh, basically couldn't reach out to people and still in EU, it, it's got we are caught up in difficulties. In uh, US, there's a big debate going on. So you, you could see geopolitical shift that is taking place, getting accelerated and a bigger focus coming on to the Indian Ocean with India and the other countries around it and some other ASEAN countries. But uh, basically, it's going to be how do we face the economic and the social disruption? Because after every pandemic, there has been no vast revolutionary changes. It's that the uh, loss of about 20% of our population made uh, sent up wages and made land, land available. We haven't got that, but the economic disruption and the social disruption is great. And how, how are you going to face those? That will, that will decide the future. <clears throat> That's a good point you made, uh, Prime Minister. I'll come back to you on this. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, request all of you to also join in the conversation. Please uh, come back and respond to what uh, other uh, Prime Minister speakers are saying. But coming to you, Aurora, on, on this issue, I think uh, Prime Minister raised the issue of leadership. But one of the things about leadership is also the leadership of multilateral organizations, uh, uh, that have been, you know, working uh, with, with you know, a lot of uh, good results, but also a lot of gaps. Uh, and there are there is a huge debate on, and I think that's one of the platforms that you're running uh, on as well. So what do you see as the role of multilateral organizations or your own personal vision of what is going to make things work and bring us together again? Yeah. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you so much for having me on such a panel with esteemed guests like everyone here, so thank you. Um, so I'll start with, of course, the suffering that COVID has brought and how it's been devastating to families. I've personally lost my grandmother to COVID, so I know the pain and suffering people have gone through. But amongst all this pain, I do want to acknowledge the awe of having produced a vaccine so quickly. And what we've learned from that extraordinary feat, especially for international organizations, are three things. The first thing is the importance of embracing uncertainty. Like having gone through a global pandemic, we can all agree that you cannot predict how the events will unfold. There's a lot of uncertainty and it has to be managed effectively. And we have to graduate from a rule-based approach to a principle-based approach. Like a lot of humanitarian work international organizations do are based on Ford Motor Company method, A, B, C, D. But pandemics and global crises don't work like that. You have to have a principle-based approach. So I think one lesson we can learn is we have to transition our bureaucracies into holocracies, which is a decentralized management that allows people to be autonomous and, and academia. And within that, it was a generational discussion between young scientists and old scientists. And I think that's something we have to bring to multilateral organizations is youth inclusiveness. Today, the leadership is the average age of UN leadership is 62. And youth are given something called visitation rights, but not participation rights. 
half of the world is under 30, majority of the world is under 40, and yet we're not harnessing the talent of this generation to bring global solutions to international stage. And I think that's something we can learn, that this generation is able to make a huge difference and is perhaps the missing link in solving international crises at the global stage. And the third thing is success means implementation. And I'll take the words of, um, of President, Prime Minister before me that um, you have to restore credibility. And the only way to restore credibility is through implementation. You cannot stop, oh, vaccine is made. Okay, have you administered it to everyone? And have you left anyone behind? And I think that's something in international organizations we tend to leave. Like once media and camera goes away, we forget about resolving issues. Haiti is a... It's something that hasn't been resolved since 2010. Libya, Syria are examples. So I think a lesson learned is implementation is critical and to take things all the way through. That's a good point, uh, Arora. I think the point on uh, on leadership uh, uh, based on principles is something which, which uh, needs to be brought back at the center of all our uh, thoughts and activities. Justin, uh, I, I want to come to you on this point, uh, you know, Clearly, the work that you've been doing in the last uh, year or so is based more on principles rather than rules. And I think some of the rules that Aurora was referring to are, are those which were meant for a different decade or a different era. Uh, in your view, uh, Justin, the fact that you have done tremendous work across so many geographies, how do you see people coming together and what kind of uh, uh, efforts are required to make it a better world? Uh, now, first off, uh I'm just humbled and honored, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, to be with all of you. You guys are geniuses in your respective fields. So I feel like uh, the crazy guy uh, in the corner here, but I um, want to say thank you so much for the honor of being able to be part of this. Uh, something that I've experienced from uh, our nonprofit, we're based in Los Angeles, but with chapters in LA, New York, Vegas, Sydney, London, and Paris. And uh, what we try to do is just try to create a relational bridge uh, between lots of the creative world, people, film, fashion, music, uh, entrepreneurs, and give them access to make a local impact right where they're at. And to answer your question, I feel like so often people, they're wanting to help, but we've made the systems and uh, kind of what she was just saying, if we could simplify the process, like give people easier access points to get involved, because I really do believe that this generation, really, they want to, they aren't living just for the almighty dollar anymore. Like people really do want the world to be a better place. They really do want hope for their kids to have a better tomorrow. But it really is up to us. Uh, it's no longer, hey, someday. Uh, it's no, that someday is now today. And so what can we do, what we can do, when we can do, where we can do it. And uh, so like even with what we're doing in the housing projects with uh, we've been there mentoring and providing uh, youth access to education. The kids uh, couldn't go to school. So we just basically started a school at our community center. Uh, they didn't have, it was a digital desert. We didn't have internet in the housing project. So we built two internet towers on our community center so the housing development could have good internet. People are like, we need healthy food. This Friday, tomorrow, we're starting a healthy uh, farmer's market thanks to Amazon and Whole Foods sending us eight to 12 pallets of food for the community a week. And we just bought a 40 foot refrigerator. So it might not always take some rocket scientist new idea, but just practically meeting people what, right where they're at. We're considered the number one most active community center in Los Angeles now. And I don't think it's anything special about us, but simply that we're meeting the need right where it's at. We didn't have the luxury, like, you know, so many essential workers of being able to just, you know, shut down or something. But the reality is, it's like, what can we do now? And are we actually answering that call? And so um, maybe we haven't done everything, uh, but I really do believe that we can all do something. And so I think that's why uh, we're all in this uh, together. And the more we can actually exchange and not worry about who gets the credit, it's really incredible what can be done. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to uh, take more. Uh, uh, go ahead, Mr. Please go ahead. Sorry. Uh, please go ahead. Please go ahead. I'd like oh. to hear your views. Yeah, um, I, just, I would like to take a, take a more pessimistic approach. You know, the name of the panel is um, uh, predicting the future post COVID. But I have to tell you, I've spent 18 years on the Global Health Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations, where we studied pandemics. 
And I'm talking about Ebola, SARS, MERS, um, and now uh, COVID. Um, and I have to say, I think we're in for a very dark time on planet Earth. Uh, I'm not so optimistic that we really will, there really will be a post-COVID. We're already seeing how it uh, changes into forms and different shapes. Um, we're responding to that, but I worry that, uh, you know, there's a question here, how can countries co collaborate for post-COVID recovery? But we're dealing with vaccine nationalism right now, where countries are using access to vaccine as a chance to improve diplomatic um, heft around the world. And, and I just think that um, is, is, I'm normally an optimist, but I'm not in this case. You know, the, the challenge today that we see uh, is, is a strong, persistent belief that the world is reacting now because the West has been affected, that the developed world has been affected by this pandemic. Uh, you know, you refer to uh, your, your experience, uh, Minister, on what happened with Zika and other uh, such uh, pandemics, which were uh, largely in one region. And therefore, maybe your US and Europe uh, and the OECD countries didn't get impacted. And therefore, it was really left to everybody. So whether you look at pharmaceutical industry globally, if you look at uh, multilateral institutions, they kind of ignored it. It was their problem. And even even uh, uh, COVID, until it was uh, only about China, people took it very lightly. It's only when it went to the West, that's when the panic hit, uh, uh, you know, the, everybody hit the panic button. So, Minister, do you think that that's, that's something we need to get over with? And, and, you know, will that help in getting you over your pessimism as well? I'm sorry, you cut off that last sentence. If you could please repeat. I couldn't hear you. So uh, how do you see, do you think that people now need to look at every crisis in every region and not just when it affects them? Yes, no, that's a really brilliant point, of course, uh, that we need to be more understanding. I mean, I, I can tell you, um, I have a, a mentee in uh, Botswana. And in fact, they're all over the world, but this particular stories from Botswana. And I said, are you guys ready? Do you have gloves? Do you have masks? Do you have everything? Oh, no, we're not going to get it. It's, it's a problem in the North. It's a problem in Europe and America. We're not going to get it in Botswana. Uh, we're not worried about this at all. And yet, you know, today I have a request from the Cypriot um, Minister of Health looking for vaccines. In my second country in Macedonia, they have no vaccines at all. People are dying by human tremendous numbers. Um, it's a really a tragedy. So, so I hear you um, when you say that we need to be more alert in general to uh, pandemics and that we shouldn't um, ignore them simply because they're not in our quadrant of the world. Prime Minister Vikram Singh, I, I think that's something which you would be very closely, uh, uh, you know, involved with the way that uh, you see leadership in different countries respond to different crises, and that response is really dependent on whether. Uh, it is impacting that particular uh, country or not. Uh, do you think that we need a new structure for us to be able to respond collectively, irrespective of where uh, the crisis starts or is? Yes. To begin with, we had only one organization, the WHO. And at the very beginning, basically, President Trump took it on. And instead of focusing on the uh, COVID, there was in fire fighting going on as to who was responsible and what the director general has done. Now that won't work. The WHO itself had limited powers. But what, what we did is we failed. We failed in it. The UN failed. So what are the structures that can be put together? <clears throat> now everyone is looking after himself. And I agree the pandemic is not yet over. Maybe you have seen the first few rounds. You come up with some vaccine which might reduce the numbers. But large parts of the world haven't got the vaccine and they won't have it for the next few years. You look at uh, one institute in India has now not been able to supply the whole of Europe. So that's, that's an idea you've got to sit down and, and plan it out. This is something that requires a G20 meeting and the G20 is not discussing it. This, this is the first issue. How is, pand is the pandemic over? No. How do we face it? How do we produce enough? You look at the numbers, 7 billion people, where are I going to get factories? And how are I going to transport them? 
the whole airline industry to get stuck in that? And have you got the infrastructure? So these are big issues that are coming up in the third world. <clears throat> I think I just want to add to that, that um, whose responsibility is it? And this is where an organization like UN can take that leadership role. And for UN to take that leadership role, there will have to be an expansion of processes. You cannot follow the same process as you've done before. And I think this is where Justin's process of being open and creative and collaborating is, is something very critical. For example, the cost of getting the vaccine to everyone is not just the cost of the vaccine, it's transportation. How do you then collaborate with everyone in the infrastructure of supply chain to get there? For example, a bottle of Coke is sold for $1.99 in US and almost the same price in Africa. So how can they manage their supply chain and how do we ensure that we capitalize on those same paths to get that supply chain out to, to people? And this is where leadership is critical and focusing leadership on not just talking, but actually getting things done. And a lot of times, especially in international organizations, we hire, um, we recruit leaders based on their political capital and, and awareness within the diplomatic community, but less on their ability to implement and I think that's a generational shift we have to see, that words are not enough. If you're dying, action is critical. So I'll just point out that uh, in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, that requires uh, ultra-cold storage, right, which many places didn't have. And so that required a major investment. Uh, my company actually manufactures those units in China. So this is something I know a little bit about, the supply chain for the COVID vaccines. Yeah. And I think so, just Justin, from your mind. perspective, uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Aurora, please go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. And no, I was just saying for supply chain is we really have to take implementation A to Z. We cannot stop when the lights and cameras stop. And we know in 2022, COVID will not be talked about. We will graduate because the Western countries would have been vaccinated. The news media will shift. But like you guys said, other parts of the world will not have vaccines. So we still have to keep on the efforts of getting things done. Justin, from your perspective, what are the learnings from this crisis? You're there on the ground, you are you are implementing, as Aurora says, you're not just talking about it and you're not looking at policy uh, measures. From the ground, what's the view you get? What needs to be done to make sure that, you know, maybe several such efforts that you have created are, are rolling out across the world? Do you feel that the, the global leadership has uh, therefore not uh, stepped up as much? They're still uh, looking at it from a narrow, maybe national perspective or self-interest perspective? I'm, I think, you know, it's easy to do the whole, you know, hindsight uh, leadership approach. Uh, but the reality is we're, we are where we are now. And what are we going to do to help move things forward? What are we going to do to help yeah, bring the world to a healthy place? And I think sincerely like, that everyone wants that. But the reality is uh, there's certain pockets like where people don't either trust the vaccine or like they have, you know, history or different things that are holding them back and so forth. And I think it really comes down to us understanding, hey, what are we all going to do to help make the world like a safer and healthier place? And I think a lot of that is just conversations like with people. Like, I mean, pass and like they'll say all these different things and like whether things are true or fiction or whatever they are set and determined in their what they think is their reality and so uh what people aren't up on they're down on and a uh, lack of uh information uh is often viewed as misinformation and so it's like hey i think just over and over people just want to know, hey, is grandma okay? Hey, you know, is auntie okay? Is this and that? So it's like, okay, let's first meet, obviously, uh, people at their areas of greatest need of, like, hey, let's uh, reach those that are in higher age, some that maybe have pre-existing conditions. Let's first make for sure, like, why we don't already have all teachers vaccinated so our kids have a chance to get back in the school system. I still don't understand why that wasn't focused, but um, the reality is, we are where we are, but we all just got to step up and like trying to help uh, realize 
how do you say this? But it's like families have to take responsibility of being a family unit. Like, Hey, your kid can't be an idiot and just like, just run around and do like whatever families need to actually show leadership in this whole process because, and in the housing developments and in communities and villages, the really the community leaders really are the ones that people are going to listen to. They aren't going to listen to the PSAs by some celebrity. They aren't going to listen to some political figure. They're going to listen to, Hey, you know, is like their community leader. Are they, going to be getting a shot hey are they because uh, people let's be honest they don't they don't often listen to uh the news <laughs> well, just your point your point's well taken but uh in your work, have you identified these leaders? Are you working with them? Do you know who to go to to uh, affect change? I'm just curious, or you're frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like with myself personally, like, I mean, I'm someone that I talk with like the leaders of like the gangs of like the Bloods and the Crips. And so like, right. it's like individuals like that, that they really do want their community to be safe. They do want them to be healthy, but they will not trust the politicians at all. And so it's like, okay, how can we help? Can we like set up a COVID testing station? Yes. Okay. Can we actually eventually be approved to be like a site where uh, some testing can be administered? Hopefully we will. But again, we don't get any government funding, for example. And like I said, we're the number one most active community center in LA, but, and we supposedly get millions and millions of dollars sent to watch housing projects, but we don't see one penny. So it's really interesting. The community is like, where does all this money go? And it's kind of like, it's just what the community has seen forever. And they're like, Justin, we don't expect anything from the government. They've always have lived on our backs is how the perspective of what they say. And I mean, and I deal with our finances. We don't get government money. I wish. Um, uh, but, you know, I guess sometimes they, the funding traditionally goes through the uh, typical uh staple named charities like the boys and girls clubs and the ymcas which i love those organizations but we need to be open to like creating new pathways forward and meeting people where they're at and uh some of these organizations that are nine to five organizations not open on the weekend and so forth, the community are not listening to hmm. have you have you contacted the mayor's office to speak to their civil society liaison i haven't uh i've spoken with some of the different people from like uh, la mayor garcetti's office and yes. they've been helpful where they can but at the same time like i understand like they're focusing on like a rollout amongst you know millions uh right here in la and so sometimes it's a little hard to get answers uh they're like hey we're opening like for example they just opened a testing spot but it's in a different area of watts well no one that's a crip will go in that territory for decades generational things beyond grape street and so forth people won't go over there so the city thinks they're meeting the need oh we got a mobile vaccination site in watts no you put it in uh, the smallest area of watts where you're already inv investing a billion dollars and they're the ones over the decades that have been doing most of the killing and so they throw the money where the killings and so forth have been. But the large population of Watts, we can't even access those vaccinations because it's an area that if they go over there, the kids are fear of life and death. It's a sad reality. Let me, let me so, talk, put this part to you. Very, very engaging uh, uh, chat. Um, and, you know, those of uh, you who are in the room and listening in, please post your comments on the chat box. I'll be happy to pick up some of those thoughts uh, as well and pose it to the panel. Uh, but, uh, Prime Minister, uh, I, I think uh, what, it's, what is appearing is that the leadership in the, in the post-COVID world is going to be uh, from civil society. You know, civil society is going to reorganize itself. There will be individual uh, who will create organizations, individuals, institutions, and, you know, Justin is an example of that. Do you feel that the post-COVID world is going to be shared by civil society and not necessarily by the political leadership? And that's a theme that I'd like to pose to all of you uh, as, as we come to the last uh, segment of our uh, discussion. Prime Minister. But I think, I, I think civil society will play a larger role. <laughs> But the politicians are going to be there, not merely the conventional politicians, 
there be new movements coming the trump movement 4 years ago is just one indication the pirate party is another but now <clears throat> especially by strengthening the online communications <coughs> and a different segments are affected and we find many new new political forces coming up so we we have to see a radical change in this and our attitudes are changing now one of the biggest issues will be that we are moving towards uh, there will be a far acceleration for climate change on the other hand the debt levels have gone up to such a extent the resources may not be available so that be one of the clashes and on public health on so many issues how do you handle the private debt how do you handle the government debt that or, or there are new issues coming in and new people will take leadership i think building on to that the so next yeah. um you know just building on to the next gener- the leadership going forward of course politicians would be there because we live in a republic society where we elect our officials and then they speak for us but i think private sector will play a key role as well you know gone are the days when private sector only cared about private profit they now care about sustainability they now care about environment that it's embedded in their actions that i think they will play a critical role in in delivering solutions to the people like a lot of companies are now committing that wherever there is a broadband we want to bring broadband like you know if we want to do that as part of csr not just donate to a charity we actually want to do things because our employees are saying they want to get involved i think the second change we can expect is a generational leadership coming in and i think that's been reflected in in american politics where you actually see one of the youngest senators elected um Pete Buttigieg with AOC with this leadership coming i think all across the world you can expect millennials taking a, a more serious role in politics and with that comes the impatience of being young like why are things taking too long like we there is an urgency for expedited solution that is something that this generation will take on critically and i think the third um thing that we'll see is digitization in everything like for one year we've almost been living in, in a cloud environment that this trend will continue even more that will now try to see how do we get more done in less mobility and how do we expand this access to other people so technology will definitely be, play a key role in leadership in its own way Justin do you want to add to this Uh no I mean I I think the reality is we're just in a interesting time and I I I do agree with what you guys are saying that I really do think uh either politics is going to be shifting uh or it's going to become more obsolete to uh the reality of people's everyday life uh because uh people are longing for answers uh and what we've seen with covid is it's it's exposed the reality of how uh yeah of how divided the world is but yet how interconnected we really are and so the reality is uh that hey um people are either going to step up and start uh meeting the needs and coming together and realizing that we need to create functional government and functional humanity like no longer hi like someone google you before they talk to you but they actually like care about true humanity and what's going on not just some pretty puff talk but like the reality is like hey like i mean Uh, we at times like i see so many dysfunctional things like uh in watch right now they're doing a gun buyback program trying to get people to turn in their guns but uh and they're ask all these politicians are sending me info saying will you please post this on social media let those in watch know about this and i appreciate they reach out to me but what they do is like they put the gun buyback program uh literally 45 minutes away close to calabasas which is like 45 like in a fancy area of los angeles and not close to where the watch residents are no watch resident is going to tr- drive 45 minutes to give in a gun for up to a 100 dollar gift card or whatever and so i think the reality is hey we got to be like actually practical and think things through before we do it not just for political things there's a zillion things i could do that i know look good on paper but would never work in the housing projects and so i think we need to make for sure that we're actually looking at is this actually really going to help and i don't think anyone ever 
means to like be disengaged from the reality. But sometimes the higher you climb up the success ladder, the more you got to like fight to stay in touch with what's going on at ground level. And I think sometimes some of the people have gotten so high on the ladder that maybe they aren't really in touch with some of the things happening at ground level. Not everyone. There's some that are incredible, but I think we can all do better to stay in touch with what's really happening. Mr. Tashkovich, uh, you know, this is something which you would like to uh, speak about. I think leadership is also about trust. And uh, what we are looking at is, is uh, instead of trust coming back and people uh, looking at a post-COVID world with, um, uh, with a sense of togetherness, uh, we are seeing now uh, new seeds of distrust coming in. Uh, and therefore, uh, what, what are the issues that we must look at to ensure that you know, we, we bring this together because next crisis could be around the corner. We don't know that. Uh, have we learned enough from what we have gone through uh, to be able to make a better collective effort next time? Hmm. Have you learned enough? I mean, I think, for example, let's just take the example of hospitals here in America. I can't speak for other parts of the world, but I, I know what it looks like here. For uh, if a hospital is running low on a supply on nitrile gloves, for example, the nurse who's in charge of procurement will just pick up the phone and call one of the six major distributors in America and say, I need a box of gloves, take the gloves, right? And they arrive next day, two days later, they get billed net 30 or net 15 uh, after that. And it's, it's a phone call. It takes a few minutes. But what happened was when COVID struck and supply chains completely broke apart from the massive demand, um, we were asking our uh, nurses to become international business experts and to try and deal with factories in a foreign language, in a different time zone, in a foreign country, um, with quality issues and so on. And lots of money was lost. Lots of people were cheated. Um, and it's a real problem. And so when I think about your question, I think about, well, how, have we provided any kind of training to our frontline staff to handle this better than they did last time? The answer is probably not because they're still busy handling this. Uh, pandemic. Um, I think of uh, how we have resiliency across a large territories, whether that be India or uh, USA or Canada or the European Union, in terms of um, the transportability of medical skills. Uh, that is to say, is a doctor who's registered in New York State, can they practice in California? And likewise with nurses or can a nurse registered in Vancouver work in Prince Edward Island and so on and so forth? And the answer is no, they can't. They have to be um, re-registered or has to be, um, um, you know, some cross uh, uh, cross recognition of skill sets. Um, and, and so these are some of the issues that I think need to be addressed, which have not been properly addressed yet. And I think just adding on to that, that is the that is the responsibility of post-COVID world for government institutions to take their role seriously. Like we cannot just expect institutions like bureaucratic institutions to stay inefficient. The people who are the beneficiaries are the ones who are suffering. And I think that's the moral and ethical leadership that we need to exhibit going forward in our institutions. Uh, and I think just as a candidate for secretary general, I can say for every dollar UN receives, only 30 cents goes to the cost. And that is a very deplorable number. And that really needs to be doubled because we don't have enough funding. Like uh, debt crisis is something countries are struggling with. They're not collecting enough re tax revenue as well. So we need to make our dollars stretch as much as we can. And that responsibility lies with bureaucratic institutions. I mean, let me ask the prime minister a question, if I might, sir. Um, uh, uh, you're in Sri Lanka, uh, Mr. Sharma's India. Let's say Mr. Sharma was Dr. Sharma. He was a world-renowned surgeon. Could he freely practice in Sri Lanka, or would there be all kinds of red tape and problems that would not allow him to do that if you had a crisis and you needed his expertise? Well, if he wants to come as a private individual and practice, there will be red tape. But if, if you send him along as a part of the international team or some country is sending a team along, it, it'll be easier, but there, there will be conflicts within, within the uh, profession. So, mm -hmm. but, but, but what we are having now, listen to everyone, 
there has been a failure to mobilize society if you look at world war 2 i mean basically we mobilized society there were three ways of doing it the extreme way as the soviet union had done or the british war socialism or what roosevelt did in usa at that time everyone got together and and they they were together till the war was over now is so we, we 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 have left the responsibility to the firms in the case, in this instance government should have funded all the research and thereby also control the profit margins we didn't do that i think it's only uk that really funded uh, most of the <coughs> uh, research then how do you distribute it so that that is what has uh, what is lacking there was no uh, global leadership or there was no attempt to mobilize the world in a threat that uh, that's the worst we faced after world war 2 Prime Minister, I, I want to come to you on this point of civil society and and society coming together. It seems to me also that uh, the societies in Asia uh, and you know Sri Lanka, India, uh, Southeast Asia, they tended to follow uh, you know the rules of COVID and lockdown much better uh, than than perhaps in the West. You know, for example, we don't have anti-vaxxers in Asia. We don't have anti-mask uh, riots mm-hmm. happening. in asia which is happening in parts of europe so it seems that despite all the troubles and challenges that we have in asia uh, the the levels of trust that society has of the government is much higher than what we see in the western world what would you say no well i i, I could it's, it's a question of development i would say in the west it has gone to such a extent that you you are basically uh, what is called a fundamental right has sometimes been taken to very very extreme levels or just before the pandemic you saw in england people are wondering whether to take down statues of eastern churches and others. i mean that that's absurd there are we have a good history and bad so you you come to a stage where people say we have a right not to wear it but rights in that way no i believe in human rights but i don't think you can take it to that extent you are by not wearing it you are posing another person uh, you are at a risk putting another person self at risk this way the asian societies are not that it's more collective this is becoming more individualistic so it's because it's uh, collective and the fear was there where people just started wearing mask after some time they were pointing at those who didn't wear mask this i would say the bulk of the western societies did took place but there was one group that insisted a minority and that minority even went to the extent of rioting so it's it's different attitudes and i think that's going to be more marked post covid <clears throat> as the geopolitics shift into asia and within asia you will find as i said earlier east asia which is on, which are on the rise and then what happens in the indian ocean with india and other countries so you 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 could see the differences that come in what we sometimes call asian values and those differences will be marked because you will find now that Asia has found their way has worked, and not the Western way as far as the pandemic is concerned. So there will be a lot of reconsideration of these issues. And finally, the factor that we are talking, we are fighting on WHO, we are fighting on the Indo-Pacific, instead of us focusing to get things back to normal. Right. So we have three minutes left. Any closing comments from all of you? Hmm. I would say that the uh, still we we haven't faced the worst. When you handle the debt problem, I think our debt to uh, uh, GDP ratio is about two hundred or three hundred percent now. How are the countries going to find money? The whole economic system has to change. The Washington consensus will change. That will be a slow process. Argentina has been going. uh again to the ims suriname there are going to be a lot of defaults and the whole system not only government debt but even the london club or all, all, all are going to come under pressure and how are you going to work this out and the unemployment the disruption of un- the unemployment the older people will not be able to find work again so the whole thing is changed so a, c- a couple of things there um the first thing just to make the observation this uh, 1.9 trillion dollar Uh, a law that, that President Biden just signed 
that amount of money, $1.9 trillion, is greater than all the money paid to taxes by corporations and individuals in the USA in 2017. So just to have some sense of what that represents. Um, the second thing I want to say is, uh, the prime minister may know in particular, uh, there are significant amounts of money which are off ledger in the banking system. And those are perhaps the next two months finding their way back into the system, which uh, may help to do the rebalancing that you're talking about. So we'll see what happens. Right. So go ahead, Aurora, then we'll close after you. You know, I was just going to say in a closing note, as much as it's, it's a very dire situation, I also sense optimism as we come out of this COVID because it's, as a world, we've gone through pain and suffering together. I think that's really aroused empathy in all of us that people going back into workforce will, will be less self-centered than they were before. And there will be more opportunities for collaboration and inclusivity. So I, I definitely sense from my generation that there's a desire to be more involved in meaningful ways. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I really do believe that uh, if we have to try to find the gold thread through it all, is that uh, the world is realizing how interconnected we all are and how we all do have a responsibility uh, to each other. Uh, no longer can we just say, oh, I'm my own self-made person. Uh, the reality is uh, we're all in this together and uh, we really should be looking out for our fellow uh, woman and man uh, in civilization. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I think uh, you, uh, Aurora, you and Justin have summarized it and made it easier for me. Thank you so much. And uh, I think the, the most important uh, uh, point is about what Aurora is running a campaign in terms of reforms of, of UN. And I think that's a great, uh, great uh, way to look at how can we make the world a better place, you know, implementing on the ground with what Justin is doing, political leadership of, of very uh, prominent leaders.